On Raiders of the Lost Ark, I was a model maker. I built uh, the fire canyon that, uh, where the Nazis meet their final doom uh, when the uh, flames come out of the Ark. On Temple of Doom, I was chief model maker and I was responsible for creating sets for the, uh, for the pit and friar. And then on Last Crusade, I did some art directing and I worked with the map department. Um, the main shot that I remember is the uh, leap of faith when uh, Indy thinks he's stepping out into a chasm. He's actually stepping onto a, a, a camouflage bridge. And I created that. Now for King of the Crystal Skull, it's nearly all digital. I'm, I'm doing one small miniature set, but uh, everything else has been digital. Digital photography, digital map painting, uh, 3D modeling and rendering. And uh, so that's completely different too. And um, the, the great thing is that it just keeps changing and, and evolving. Well, one of the, the first things we got to do, which is the opening of the movie, is the, uh, the sort of the famous dissolve from the Paramount logo into the sort of location that sort of sets the scene. And, you know, I mean, we first saw it as the animatic. And in the case of this film, it was a dissolve from the Paramount logo into uh, a, a prairie dog mound. And the, the dirt breaks away, the prairie dog comes out, looks around, then jumps out the way as this vehicle comes and runs it over. And in, in the case of this shot, we, um, they had a practical plate they shot on location. And then we went and we uh, did some rough animation of this to sort of figure it all out. And then we did a stage shoot for the Prairie Dog Mound itself on a blue screen, collapsing away with a little blue mandrel pushing through. And then we went in and did the animation to that for, for the final sort of performance. So we actually, had, we actually did have this, uh, this guy, which was nicknamed Buster. He's the, uh, the stuffed Prairie Dog, who's, uh, as you can see, is a little worse for wear. And he's been, you know, he's been soaked and blow dried and cleaned. But he, he sort of pr provided sort of reference as far as lighting and scale. So they would shoot this guy just to help the guys with the fur and all that kind of stuff. And that's what will sort of end up in the movie. one of the first people to wander into the film because uh, we need to get the, you know, we call them assets, sort of ready to flow up the pipeline early on. And uh, there's this infinite list of, vari of variables uh, that we need to focus on in order to get something uh, to hold together at the end of the day. And photo reference is a big help, not only for texture, uh, but for understanding how things put together and, you know, how they looked on the set. Once we've gathered sufficient reference so that we can start building these things, um, you know, model making 101 really quickly is that forms in the computer are defined by lines and points and you can move those points and you can add more points and if you keep doing that for about two weeks you get a car <laughs> or in the case of this film uh, you keep moving those points around until you get dragon heads on top of stones with some vases. So after Dave and or Dave's crew creates the shape in the computer then it gets handed over to the paint department or the texture department as a gray box without all the wood and pictures on it. And so based on photo reference that are taken on set, it's uh, the texture department's job to put not only the color on there, but how bumpy is this? You know, wood has a different surface quality than a metal table does and things like that, whether it's shine, you know, super shiny chrome metal or painted car metal or things like that. And that's what we would apply to the models that the model department creates. When those items move down the pipeline and get put into a shot, they can be lit and have proper material qualities so they can fit right into a scene and then the compositors do their magic. In the shot, the crate that they're looking for has you know, special properties. And um, again, those special properties are, are not ones that you can establish in the, in the physical world. So it falls on us to, to create that. First, the, you know, the first things that you get is we start with nothing there, and then we tilt up, and um, we have the box, and as you can tell in this area, the, the set ends. So we flesh out this environment, and the lights go miles and miles deep, and then we do treat it with um, haze. And then we have all of the special properties of the computer-generated chunks of stuff on the ground that are sort of wobbling along. And then the dog tags and gun straps, they all move in sort of a magical, magnetic way. And then this is the, uh, the final where We've obviously 
done a lot to create this, this world that obviously can't be achieved in the real world. Again, compositing, that's, that's, our, um, that's the bread and butter, is um, taking work from other departments and, and you know, nudging a little further along to, to give it that sense of reality. On this picture, we are doing a lot of miniature work, and that's for several reasons. Uh, one of them being that, that Steven Spielberg is very, and George Lucas too, is very careful about uh, how realistic the work that we do is. And to do certain things that have to do with pyrotechnics, nuclear explosions, uh, things that uh, need to have weight, we need to go the miniature route. And then complement that and supplement that with computer work. Kerner Optical, they, they develop all the miniatures that we use throughout the movie, whether they're actually blowing the miniatures up or they're actually just building something that then later gets photographed to be put into the shot later. We have a, an example here of the, one of the models they actually made for us. This was for the temple sequence at the end of the movie. We asked them to build this particular miniature. We had it built on a Lazy Susan so it could be rotated by, by one artist and then photographed by another one. And then they would get the lighting right to match into the actual shot. Uh, and then we would bring that work back here to ILM and then place it into the actual painting. Um, we would also do a lot of close-up work as well for miscellaneous shots. So we would pull out some of the detail from the actual vines, some of the bricks as well, for placing later in the background. The plates were shot on location at Universal Studios, but it was about two stories tall and it needed to be about six stories tall. So we used the photographs that we collected from this particular miniature to extend the temple up another, another four stories. So here you can see the actual set as it was in Universal Studios. We have the blue screen back in the distance and you can see that the actor's actually running onto the ground. So you, you know this set here isn't six stories tall. And then using the photographs that we got from the actual miniature at Kerner, shot in the, in the right sort of lighting environment, we reprojected that, those photographs onto CG geometry and then placed it into the shot and extend the actual temple. And obviously we put the mountain behind as well and then later smoke was integrated and all the guys that were running out of the temple were rotoed out and placed over the actual extension at the bottom. To get all of that stuff moving and churning and keeping that energy moving right at camera, the best solution that Steven and Pablo decided was to do that in miniature. This is a rocker mortar filled with aluminum oxide. It's basically a giant shotgun blast and there's the camera right there. So it's a shotgun full of aluminum pointed straight into the lens of the camera. We built eight scale houses that were all designed to be destroyed. Um, we set up a huge deck. Uh, our neighborhood was something like 60 by 100 feet. Um, in that neighborhood would be multiple houses. So we had going up the street, you know, like 15 houses, something like that. Um, in the houses, we had 100 gallon air cannons that were designed and actually installed into the set by our effects supervisor, Jeff Heron. So the 100 gallon air cannons were providing a tremendous push with air. And along with some pyrotechnics and primer cord, we used big um, Volkswagen fans to keep the air moving and get a tremendous amount of push on this thing. So in the first shot, that's what happens. So we had to destroy the neighborhood in the first shot and then we wiped the slate clean and we brought in a whole nother set of houses for the high angle, which destroyed even more houses at one time um, for the big master wide shot. But when we have the thing coming down and destroying 15 houses at one time, we had the ability to only do this one time. So that was a very, very stressful uh, situation. How you doing, Bubba? Uh, last wire, boss. Right on. Oh, that was a good shot.
So that footage is handed over to ILM because our nuclear wave was confined to the sort of the width of the street and the houses combined, okay? It was enough for us to create that much energy. But if you're looking at a shot like that, the band of energy coming at us would be, you know, all the way side to side. So ours was working in the middle and they have extended it digitally in addition to the Digimap background. We were given an animatic that had placement, general size, and this is the, the plate that we received to work with. And we were told that the bear, uh, part of the screen was, was meant for the nuke, and we were left to match it with our realistic looking bomb. And you can see we had to basically remove the sky, replace the sky, add quite a bit of debris and dust and flame to the ground, and of course the giant nuclear explosion. One thing about the jungle is that it was interspersed between the real location stuff in Hawaii and then with our visual effects shots. Now the good news was we had reference. The bad news is we had reference because we had to match it and had to look like that. So that made our job a lot more difficult. So we had what we call the bowling alley effect. You had the road, you had the verticals, and it was all cleared out in between, so it looked like a bowling alley, just a straight shot. The idea is we had to bring the jungle in and close everything down to make it claustrophobic, to, to sell it to the audience that they are driving through the jungle, they're not on a road. We've given the director the freedom to go on location and shoot in a safe environment for him to actually get the the atmosphere, the wind, the noise, the, the bugs in the air, everything that, that, that really tells the viewer that this is a real dangerous location. But then take it back to ILM and actually enhance and, and make it just a little bit more dangerous. So it really does give the, the director the freedom to go and shoot wherever he likes and knowing we can always come back to ILM and, and add that element of danger that he couldn't necessarily do on location. We couldn't very well be shooting at and, and hooking up all the pyro when you have the, the talent right next to the, to the bushes they're driving by. It's a little bit dangerous, so that's when we go to the stage. We will take a, a couple of days and go through and just get the pyro crew and, and do a bunch of different versions, kind of get the different feeling depending on where you're at. So then we have the, the bullet hits on the trees that we were adding in to make it, to make it look like all these explosions so that they're actually shooting at the characters but you want to get the fall off the lighting correct from based on the plate and all these little things that you don't really think about until it goes into actually blending it into the plate and making it feel like it was all shot at one time. On this movie, what the script required was something that we couldn't ever capture, corral, and direct. So for the first time, breaking the tradition of practical, creepy crawlies, ILM had to provide the creepy crawlies for uh, Crystal Skull. Siafu. What? Big damn ant skull! <laughs> the ant sequence has always been there. Ever since the very, very beginning, the very first draft, we had the ant sequence. It was even in a script for uh, Last Crusade that was actually done about the Monkey King in Africa which had this army getting thrown into the pit with the ants and having to eat them and all that sort of thing. So that's an old idea that sort of has managed to migrate through all of the drafts. And here it became more animation working in conjunction with the simulation team to figure out a way of creating just crowds and crowds of, of, of ants. So again, the, the process begins looking at reference and then doing some animation tests to help show how these things would, would move. And from there, we provided some basic animation cycles, just repetitive walking, stopping actions that get plugged into this sort of engine that allows hordes and hordes of ants to be created. And then on top of that, we would keyframe animate specific ants for various shots. There's a sequence where, uh, where Spalco is pointing a gun at Indy and an ant crawls through over her hand and then bites her. And that individual ant would be keyframe animated. But then we're in a wide shot where you just see tens of thousands, they would all be handled through simulations. The crowd system is how we control the ants. Um, you can't animate each one by hand individually, so you assign behaviors. And the behaviors for these guys were generally head in this direction, but we added things like hesitation, 
um, and uh, they would chase after certain characters and they would stack on top of each other, uh, which was something new that we did for the film. So um, we had some really challenging shots where ants needed to be crawling all over the characters. And for those, we would take our uh, CG version of the character and do a match animation to what the actor did. And that match animation had to be so tight and so specific that the ants would stick exactly where we put them on the plate. Don't move your head at all. Ah! Ah! Don't freeze. Screaming. Got it. Good. So this is kind of one of the main bad guys, uh, and this is some of our early tests of, of being able to stream ants up and over him into his mouth, and in the end, you just end up with enough of his face to, to kind of recognize him throughout the, the entire shot. He was uh, rigged up with a bunch of wires and was pulled up into this mound. And one of the most difficult parts was trying to figure out how do we get all the ants to uh, react in such a way that it looks as though they're pushing him up from underneath. And as he's you know, swinging around, uh, whether we have ants kind of coming off his body or other ones kind of filling in the gaps where his legs are, um, all that had to be choreographed to figure out how best to move him from one point to another. So I just worry that are there too few ants leading this charge? Okay. Well, take a look at your film. If you still feel that way, then, then we'll, uh, we'll increase the amount, maybe by I'll double or something know. like that. Yeah. Okay. okay. We could just cut this into the other do Raiders documentary. Remember where I said we need 7,000 more snakes? I could yeah. say, you know, we need about 140,000 more ants. There's <laughs> just enough, there's just not enough ants you know, at the forefront of this shot. We would get together with uh, Stephen on a, on a weekly basis to re review our work via a conference calls, like a video conference calls every week. And it was actually uh, in a meeting once that Stephen suggested this idea that if the room was spinning, it could be like one of the skulls would stop, one of the skeletons would stop, and all the others would form in. And with each one kind of intersecting, it would form out this alien that would then eventually come out of its chair. A portal, a pathway to another dimension. Don't think we want to go that way. I think one of the most challenging things that we as visual effects artists have to do is the destruction of the temple at the end of the film is basically taking the temple and converting it into, into particles. Um, and so we had to do a lot of research and development into that. It's not just particles that uh, you know turn into water or dust or fire it's is behaving in a specific way and it has to be completely realistic particle simulation um, uh, is basically a lot of tiny little um, pieces which uh, have fields which are applied onto um, these little things say it's a rock or say it's um, a bunch of uh, debris and uh, basically we give uh, Field, we pass fields through the, these uh, particles or these objects, uh, say it's like a hurricane force wind or a bunch of gravity, and uh, the objects react uh, in a certain way to start moving uh, the way that we want it to. And in the case of this film, it's not enough that these things break apart as individual stones. The stones themselves have to break apart. Um, so this all needs to be split up into tiny pieces. Um, what we're looking at here is a small portion of the antechamber. Um, and by the time you spread all that out and fill the room, um, we had about 8,000 individual parts in this one set, uh, which included about 50 to 60 of the artifacts um, of the room and all the architectural uh, detail. The, the largest set we built, the Temple Heart set, has 34,000 pieces. <laughs> so we built a lot of bricks yeah. and uh, covered them inside and out, all the right way around. The script and the animatic had everything being sucked up into this hole and at one point it was going to be a, like a black hole and we thought it'd be a little more fun to make it functional looking like it, you know, something working in the ship. Um, so we came up with this blender concept and it looks kind of, we've been calling it the garbage disposal. And, uh, and it basically inhales the entire throne room to get 
to get rid of that and reveal the ship. And uh, the spaceship was the biggest design element that we had to tackle. We wanted to give it an Area 51 B-movies kind of 50s vibe so that it had a kind of vintage feel. And here's our uh, spaceship taking off. But uh, yeah, it was a massive undertaking to fill in those blanks. Part of the crater is holding back this immense lake. And there's an event that causes the walls of this crater to crumble and uh, the lake to burst through and then fill the crater valley and, and hide the temple and its remains uh, beneath this lake. Usually, you know, we're doing water, people say, you do it under a certain scale, say like quarter scale or even six scale, after that it just doesn't look right because water is water and you can't really change its physical properties obviously too much and how it reacts. But we built this model at 24th scale because in fact the cliffs were meant to be you know roughly 500 feet tall and what we did was we just build sections of it to have the water action, the cliffs crumbling away. But one of the things that helped us on this was that the camera was actually very far away, about 100 feet away when we filmed it. So you never got a real close-up view of it, the water interacting with our set. But when it had to crumble apart, it had to have weight to it and it had to be able to somewhat withstand the force of the water long enough at least for the, all the water to break up. But CG was then going to put it all together in a big giant matte painting. So what you actually see in the movie is much larger than what we built. You know, a lot of the work that we're doing is groundbreaking, you know, uh, particle simulation work that couldn't be done two years ago. And it's all this effort, you know, great team effort, uh, that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Uh, you know, I, like I said before, I mean, I never, I never stress when I do a project like this because I always know that the kind of people that we work with over here at LM are great and they're funny, uh, enjoy to work with. You know, every morning I, I you know, I get up just to come to the Ailes just to take a look at uh, the stuff that, that we do, you know. Excellent. Well, this is the guy, this is all fabulous. Thank you. This is fa fantastic stuff. Okay, okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, let's get upstairs and look at this.